Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's conversation on the YouTube Creator Sub Podcast. Dusty Porter here, the host of the show. As always, joined today by David Allen Arnold. Let me tell you about David real quick before I uh, chat with him here. He's a distinguished helicopter cameraman and influencer, renowned for capturing dynamic aerial footage for blockbuster films and popular TV shows like SWAT, The Amazing Race, and Survivor. With over 2.7 million followers across social media, David leverages his expertise in aerial cinematography, content creation, and visual storytelling to enhance visibility and engage audiences. His work exemplifies technical skill and creative vision, making him a pivotal figure in aerial cinematography. And to top it all off, his YouTube channel, which is less than two years old, now has, I'm going to check as I'm recording this, right at 214,000 subscribers and not even 500 videos yet. David, how are you doing today? Dusty, I cannot tell you how excited I am to be on your show. I'm a, I'm a fan and a, and a regular listener to your podcast. Well, that means a lot to me. Whenever I stumble upon someone that I discover and find kind of, you know, organically on YouTube and they say, hey, you know, I either listened to your show when I was starting or I'm currently listening, it really does motivate me to continue to make the show the best it can be. So I appreciate you saying the kind words. Now, with that out of the way, let's talk about what you got going on. So the David Allen Arnold YouTube channel, you primarily, if not exclusively, do vertical YouTube shorts, which is something I want to bring up going into this. Uh, the channel has exploded. Um, talk about the journey of starting the channel and the whole origin story of the channel and kind of what you've experienced thus far. Well, the the origin of my YouTube is interesting. Um I come from the world of mass communication. You know, for 30 years, I've been working in movies and television as a cameraman. And so about almost 10 years ago, I started, someone pushed me onto social media and <laughs> I didn't like it. I didn't want it, but I said, okay, fine, I'll do it. And so I, I started using, you know, some of these free apps that I could put on my phone and create things and put them out to the audience. Um, and I stayed away from YouTube. To, to me, uh, sorry, YouTube, but Google is a pretty political company. And I didn't like all of the censorship and stuff they were doing. So I, I just avoided it. And then about, I guess about a year and a half ago, I was starting to hear, you know, social media experts say, hey, YouTube Shorts is uh, coming on strong and and Google is making a a heavy push to sort of, you know, follow in TikTok's uh, mm -hmm. footsteps. And so I said, okay, all right, I'll, I'll start doing a few shorts while I'm doing everything else. And um, I found out that the, the social media coaches were right, <laughs> that uh, YouTube was very excited and very uh, enthusiastically promoting YouTube shorts. So it, it was a good place to start posting some of my vertical videos and uh, I experienced a lot of viewership uh, and very rapid growth in about a year and a half I went from almost zero to like you said now 214,000 subscribers and you already had the knowledge and history of creating content, vertical content over on TikTok, am I right? So that's kind of like, where did it all start? Like, get, take us back to the beginning of your online content creation. Obviously, you've worked in mainstream films and, and TV shows doing uh, aerial footage for a bunch of big, big companies and organizations. But then you went to the online content creation route. What was your, where did you start? I started with Instagram and I, um, you know, I work on big TV shows. So the thing about me is I never, I never hold things back. So if, if you're a big shot TV producer and I'm working on your show and we're sitting at the lunch tent, I'll tell you what's happening on Instagram, what I'm doing there and the success I'm finding. And so the TV producers always just kind of stared at me kind of blankly, like, you know, they'd be polite and they'd listen, mm -hmm. but like all of this social media internet stuff, was just a great mystery to them. And over the years, as I moved into other uh, platforms like TikTok uh, and started to get just, you know, nowadays I get about a million views per day across all platforms. The TV producers started to get quiet <laughs> and they started to lean in <laughs> and they started to ask questions because 
I'm getting more viewership on these free apps on my smartphone than they get for their television shows. Mm -hmm. And they know the power and the, the monetary value of that. <laughs> so let's start there then. How you've done such a good job of growing your, your, your audiences across all the different platforms. What are some things that you've learned along the way that, because this isn't like a viral video. I mean, you, you are consistently hitting hundreds of thousands of views over on TikTok and hundreds of thousands of views on your YouTube shorts. What are you doing to captivate the audience? Like what are, what are you doing to really grow into, I mean, is it storytelling? Is it your personality? Is it how you come across? Like, what are you, give us the whole thing. H how are you doing this? That, that is such a great question. And to be honest with you, I did steal uh, a good part of that from television. I'm a helicopter cameraman, so I'm very specialized. And so I'm generally not involved with the creation of the show, the storyline, the cast members of the show. Mm -hmm. I'm just usually flying over them in a helicopter, looking down and zooming in with my gyro stabilized camera. However, any chance I could, I would always go into their meetings and just sit in the back of the room and just listen to A, how they chose the stories they want to put on television, mm -hmm. B, how they would get the content from their cast and from the city they were working in. How did they solve that problem of getting what they need to tell the story they want to tell? And then how they would piece it together at the end. I, I would just pay attention. And and what I found was, you know, the world of television goes back and film goes back, you know, over a century. And these guys have gotten very good at telling stories, gathering the pieces in a legal fashion that they can legally share to everyone throughout the no universe in perpetuity and make money from it. A lot of that is actually missing from YouTube. And one of the things that I learned from them was because on social media, people will always say, oh, Dave, your, your niche, your niche is this, your niche is that, or how did you choose your niche or what's your niche? And what I learned from the TV producers is they will follow any story that makes them feel a strong emotion. And if you look at the TV shows, these are all made by master storytellers. And you look at it on paper. I've, I've been doing uh, flying in a helicopter for Deadliest Catch for 20 years. And if I were to describe that show to you and you had never seen it, you would say, come again. It's, it's a bunch of fishermen. Okay. They're in the middle of nowhere. And it's a really dirty boat and it stinks and they're covered in, in fish guts and grime and they stink too. It's a filthy, disgusting mess. And they could be crushed or killed, you know, on this boat or the boat could sink in the middle of nowhere and no one even knows where they are. And that's the story. <laughs> and you would say, well, I don't think I want to watch that, but that's proof that you can go into any environment and you can find stories that create an emotional impact. And that's what these producers do. They sit on this crab fishing boat and they watch what's happening and it is very dangerous and it is very dirty and disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, but they watch and they say, Oh, Oh, this is interesting. You know, this one fisherman has a, a sister with a disability back home. Mm. And he's 3,000 miles from her. So for him, just to hear her voice on the boat's radio gets mm. him all excited and emotional. And so the producer says, okay, yeah, we're going to shoot the fishing, but I, I want to zoom in on this guy when he talks to his sister. And if you approach any environment in that way, on any topic, any so-called niche or genre, you can find stories that bring an emotional impact That's right. and the more unusual and the more unexpected it is the better 
that story or that so-called niche can become. I love that. Um, I have watched The Deadliest Catch. Uh, I was watching it with my nine-year-old daughter not too long ago, and she was so intrigued by that. And you say you've been working on that show for almost two decades? Yes, I was there. Uh, I got a phone call 20 years ago, and they said, ah, these, these guys want you to go out into the middle of nowhere in the Bering Sea and fly in a helicopter and fly over these uh, crab fishing boats. And... Uh, <laughs> And I said, uh, okay. Yeah. The the biggest story of my television career is I'm I'm always just willing to go. <laughs> you, 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 they call and you say yes. That's right. I love that. You're 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 willing to experiment. Now back to the storytelling because I think there's something there with what you're saying. There's so much to what you just said. I want to kind of uh, hone in on it a little bit. So on YouTube, on these YouTube shorts, and in TikTok, in these vertical video. You only have up to, you know, 60, 90, whatever it is for the platform, right? So you don't have very long. So what are your tactics and what are your methods of really succeeding with vertical video when you only have that amount of time to explain a story to really capture their attention? And in the in the culture we're living in now, you know this as well as I do, David, um, people's attention span, very, very short. So you've got to really capture them from the beginning. So how are you evoking these emotions with this small amount of time? Well, a, a lot of what I am doing is I'm looking for things that people haven't seen or thought about before. So if it's something that they see every day and they don't know how it work, works, for example, a garbage truck. Okay, every week that thing comes clanging through the neighborhood and dumps everyone's uh, trash cans and then leaves them on a heap on the sidewalk. But no one ever actually looks at the truck and pays attention to how it works or, or what, what are the controls that the operator uses mm -hmm. or is the truck automated? Does he just get it to the can and then the truck finds the, the canister and lifts it up and dumps it? Um, and so even though it's something that everyone sees every day, if they don't actually know how it works, I can glue them to the screen just by showing them, especially the sort of unexpected things uh, that the trash truck guy deals with every day. To him, it's mundane and nothing. But to us, as normal residents of the city, it's actually fascinating how the truck works and then like what happens when it goes wrong. <laughs> like what happens when the, the trash can gets dumped right on top of the, <laughs> the cab of the truck? Yeah. So that that's a lot of what I'm looking for is just things that people don't get to see every day because I don't even have to do a voiceover for that. I can just do a headline that says, um, well, the truck driver never expected this. And then it's just a video of him, you know, how he maneuvers the truck and the controls and the hydraulics and then watching the trash can accidentally dump it onto his you know, where he's sitting <laughs> instead of in the back <laughs> of the truck where it's supposed to go. I don't even have to do a voiceover. I don't have to explain it. People can just know, oh, okay, this is something to look at. And then they're just watching it. They, they don't get to see this every day. And it's interesting. And so uh, the process of the, the driver doing what he does, the truck doing what it does, and then just watching the can move, it's a process that people can follow along with. And once you get them started, into the process, they just naturally want to see what uh, happens next. That happens with me with food, with like recipes. So where I'm watching a YouTube short and it all depends on what you're interested in, right? And the algorithm learns you very quickly. Um, my wife and I were talking just last night. Um, this is a funny side story. We have two dogs, uh, two golden retriever dogs, and we just recently got a, a, a kitten. And my youngest daughter's been wanting a kitten, and uh, we got a kitten. And every ad and everything on my wife and my cell phone is all about kitten stuff. And she is convinced that last night she was on TikTok, and they were showing her Homeward Bound, which, if you don't know, they have two dogs and a cat in, in, in the movie. And she said, I swear they know what we're doing. Well, you know, So the algorithm will figure you out, right? So when I'm watching these recipes... And these guys grilling, you're right. I, I watched that first time they splat down that first ingredient. And from then on out, they may not be saying anything, but I want to know the process. 
It's visual storytelling is what it is. You're, you're taking something visually and you're taking someone from the beginning to kind of a, 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 a peak, a climax there, and, and, and then you're ending it with a conclusion. And storytelling is just that, right? So can you give us, David, some pointers on how to be better storytellers as creators, not only just visually, but with, with our writing or copy and things like that as well? Well, I, I'll tell you, one of the things that I do, uh, I do almost all of my posts within the platform. So if I'm making a YouTube short, as much as I can, uh, I'll even give up things so that I can make it in the platform on my phone. And when I'm editing it, I usually look at it because people say, oh, make a seven to nine second video or make it 15 seconds or, or whatever. I usually look at it. And when I get to the end of the clip, if I feel like it ends too soon, that's usually the right length for me. That's usually the right length because- Ooh, that's that's good. I, like I want that. them. I want the viewer to feel like. Uh, wait, wait a sec. I, I didn't see the. Uh, well, let me see that again. You know, like if it's the trash truck, mm -hmm. I want them to get to the end, and I'm not wasting their time. I'm. I don't do clickbait. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever I said on the headline for the video is coming quick, and then I'm very efficient with the storytelling and editing. And I really like for them to feel like, oh, that was really inner. Man, I got to see. I want to see that again because I didn't really see what the can did. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then, of course, in the world of YouTube. They're now seeing, oh, well, this video has a one point five, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, 150 percent watch time. <laughs> and really, right. it's just because I was so efficient with my 15 seconds that. I, I left them a little bit curious, like they enjoyed the video. It was neat to watch. And they're kind of like, man, that was so good. I'm going to, yep. I got to see that again. Yeah. It's like a good radio teaser. I love the way that you put that. I've never seen it framed or never really heard it framed quite like that. When you're editing the video, when you feel like it ended a little too soon, that's kind of your sweet spot of knowing, okay, we're there. Um, I've kind of gotten that way about my intro. When I do tutorials, on my YouTube channel, if I'm editing and I say, maybe I should have said a few more things in the intro or maybe I left this out, I'm like, no, no, that's the perfect link. That's about where it needs to, to land. Um, so next time you guys who are listening to this, uh, next time you're doing a video when you're like, oh man, this video should have been like seven minutes or this video should have been whatever, but you ended it in like five minutes and 45 seconds, that's probably the sweet spot, right? Like don't cut the fluff. Um, you talk about your headlines, which, you know, you call them titles, whatever you want to call them. How are you coming up with your titles and your copy for your titles and your descriptions and all of that? Um, I, I like to say what's in the video. Mm -hmm. And I like to write the, the titles that I would click on. Okay. So I would click on a video of the trash truck driver never saw this coming. Right, <laughs> because I'm instantly curious. So obviously, this is something that's either annoying, or spectacular, mm -hmm. or funny, or disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> and and now, if it makes the the trash truck driver freak out, mm -hmm. now I want to see what it is. Like if it has, if if it causes that reaction in him and he does it every day. Now I really want to know like what happened when he was driving his truck. Do you feel like the curiosity is what really powers a YouTube short or a vertical video on TikTok or Instagram when they're reading that title? Because let's be real, a lot of the discoverability on vertical video is people swiping up or down. So it's what their algorithm is. Now, the initial click on YouTube or tap on their phone for a YouTube short will have to come from the title. So it's really about once you get them there, keeping them there, and that goes back to storytelling. What are some things you've learned along the way to evoke that curiosity? Just that like, man, I, I want to know because I love how you've walked us through this entire episode of this podcast of you started with the example of the garage of the garbage man. And now you've given us an example of the title. Um, 
give us a, a, an example of like what you would do for the thumbnail because we can't do custom thumbnails for YouTube Shorts, right? So how would you frame that? Like what what frame would you select? Like like the 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 trash can being at the top of the truck about to be dumped, or how how would you do it? Yeah, I um on YouTube, I kind of I'll, I'll scroll back and forth. Like like we could say I'm not allowed to make a custom, uh, but you thumb, are, but thumbnail. you are. Right, right. Or we could say, okay, YouTube's saving me a bunch of time. That's right. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I don't have to go through this process. I can just literally just scroll back and forth in the video. And I'm looking for usually people, myself included, like faces. Um, the algorithms, I think, like to see a human form. Mm -hmm. So if I can get an image in that video that has the driver and his hand on the levers, but I can see him in the picture. Mm -hmm. um, that's usually very strong for me. Or if it's just a bright, bold, kind of beautiful close up of some part of the truck, mm -hmm. it like I can't see what it is, but it's an interesting shape and it has lots of contrast. Like if it's a strong image, it could just be the handles, you know, the six mm -hmm. levers and those handles that he you know, pushes and pulls to, to make the truck work. Um, that's for me, the other thing that I would go for is either a, a human form for the algorithm to see, for the viewer to see and relate to, or some just like interesting shape. Because not only do you have the nice title and copy you're using for the headline, but now you have a picture of him about to do the act of whatever's about to be disgusting or exciting or whatever emotion that you're trying to pull out of, right? Because you've got to get them to stay. Now, you mentioned just a few minutes ago about you like to do everything in platform, which I love that. Like, the stuff you're doing is not high budget. You don't need a ton of gear. I mean, you're a guy who flies helicopters with all kinds of doodads, right? So you know the high budget stuff. But you're doing all of this very simple, very easily, very quickly, very efficiently. Give us your workflow. Like, what does it look like when you make a YouTube short from start to finish? What are, what tools are you using? Software, hardware, everything. It it all rotates around this, my smartphone. Mm -hmm. Um. I learned years ago that these social media platforms, I think they magically know when you have shot or created something with your phone and they have trained their algorithms to look for that. I feel like, um, not to get too far off track, but Instagram wants to grab people's attention, get them watching. And one of the things that they use is Insta, like it's happening now, mm -hmm. like for them, if I spent $100,000 and had a slow motion camera with a $100,000 lens looking at a garbage truck, they're not so much interested in that. They're really more interested in what if Dusty was walking the two dogs and the trash, trash truck accidentally threw the trash can over the truck onto the neighbor's yard mm -hmm. and it empties out on the, on the other house's yard. Mm -hmm. And he just happened to get it while it was happening with his phone. Well, they, I think they feel like that is just happened. It's in the moment and there's no other way to get it. You mm. either had to have a security camera or Dusty just happened to be making a video of his dogs and whoa, what's going on with this truck? And so they're looking for things that have been captured and created on the phone because I think they feel like it's getting their network out into the world where things are happening mm. uh, in a way that can be captured in no other way. Yeah. And what you're talking about really is authenticity. They want authenticity and transparency and realness. And I've talked about this over the past couple of months. I believe YouTube is really shifting to a more less edited, less overly edited videos, and more just raw people talking to the camera. Uh, people are loving that. They're consuming video like podcasts now. They're just kind of turning their phone on, playing a video. I do that a lot of times if I'm out and about doing stuff with the kids. 
Um, I love that. It's 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 you know if you got the smartphone, which most people do, not not everyone does listening to this, but most people do. Uh, you already have the biggest tool that you need in in the tool belt uh, already there. Just learning how to do everything on YouTube. You can go to YouTube and learn for free how to do all of that. Let's talk about monetization for a minute. Can you talk, David, about how are, how are you making money from all this, like from the, the internet videos? So in the case of YouTube, um, I, I got a lot of viewership quickly. And so I, I very quickly jumped over, like as they were creating monetization for shorts, mm -hmm. I was, <laughs> I was leaping over the, the, uh, the bar. Um, and so that tends to get probably uh i would say an average of about seven hundred dollars a month mm -hmm. that's the only thing i do right is uh my shorts are monetized and um you know i think most people would look at that and go oh well that's not that much money uh, but i i'm a very simple person so i i feel like if tiktok gives me three dollars today or if YouTube gives me $50 today, that's $50. Mm -hmm. I'm excited. <laughs> right, right. I, I love that. Now, are you considering doing branding or sponsorships or bringing on affiliate marketing? Or is Are these all things you've considered? Or are you just content with just doing what you're doing and making the videos and then getting whatever the ad revenue is? I, I only started to monetize anything about a year and a half to two years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, so if if you're an if you're starting your YouTube channel and you're looking forward to monetization, um I want to soften your expectations a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um I like for people who are getting into social media to look at it more like farming than gold mining. Mm -hmm. Because that's the reality of it is it's getting up every day. It's grinding, doing your work, creating stories, delivering value uh, day in, day out, year after year. And then if you do that for long enough, you'll start to get traction and improve your viewership numbers, and then you'll start to make money. But I don't feel that any of this is really a, a get-rich-quick uh, formula. <laughs> that is such a good analogy. And, you know, the way I think of it when I release a video tutorial showing people how to do something with technology is exactly with your analogy. It's kind of like a plant, right, that I'm I'm putting out there and, you know, I'm watering it. And then eventually, as time goes on, the algorithm shines some sun on it, right? And then the fertilizer, right? So putting something, you, it, there, this is not a get rich quick. This is not what this is. I've had so many people that I've seen on YouTube try to imitate exactly what I did with my channel from 14 years ago and do technology tutorials. And they tried to upload like 10 videos a day and they tried to do all this and, and they were looking for a quick buck. What they didn't understand is that 15 years ago when I started, I made a pact with myself that I wanted to make the highest quality technology tutorials that YouTube had. And that was my standard, and I still do that to this day. Now, the topic may be simple. It may be mundane for a lot of people, but my audio is going to be crisp and clear. My video is going to be understandable. My transitions are going to be limited. It's going to be something that by the time they get to the end of the video, they're going to know exactly what they came there to know. So understanding that you're right, you have to really put in the time and the effort is, is a big deal. What's something you wish you would have known sooner? Like looking back at it now, you're looking at the journey thus far and you're like, man, I wish I would have known that sooner. That's that's what I wish I would have known is that um, I've been doing social media. And to me, I consider YouTube to be social media. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing it for almost 10 years. And my success there has been a very slow uh, two steps forward, one step back experience and i definitely would want new creators to know that you're this is more like an exercise program you know you don't go to the gym one or two days and you look like a physique model 
um, you're probably going to do that for 10 years. Mm. And if you do it consistently, you're probably going to have good results and you're going to be healthier and you're going to look better. But it, none of it is instantaneous. And that for me is how all of this internet, social media stuff is. It's, it's a very long, slow process. And so what I have learned through experience is that I place more value on the human connections that I'm making along the way. So I feel like if I put a video on YouTube and this happens, YouTube algorithm may see a red flag. Uh Oh, uh, that's the shape of a gun. It, it could be part of the trash truck. It doesn't matter. I've triggered the algorithm mm -hmm. and it's automatically, no one's looking at it at YouTube. Right. It's automatically sent to the penalty box. No mm -hmm. one's going to see that video. Sorry. I don't care if you spent a week making that video. No one's going to see that video. And I look at that and I go, yeah, but two people saw it. And believe me when I tell you, if I'm getting a million views a day, I adore the two people who saw the video that YouTube <laughs> kicked yeah. out and I value that. So I feel like if I spent a week doing something and two people saw it, I won. If you can have that type of a mindset, you'll never get discouraged. Mm. You'll never want to quit and you will enjoy every single day of that eight or 10 year process, whatever it turns into. I've found that people love the idea, David, of being online or being an influencer or creating video. It's it's the idea of the success, though. It's with anything in life. They love the idea of the money or the uh, notoriety or the fame that may or you know uh, that may come with that. What they don't see is kind of like a, a baseball player, like you mentioned with the gym analogy. They don't see the the Monday morning in January where you're getting up and it's cold and you're going to the gym and you're doing your routine over and over again. Or for a YouTuber, the, the times where you don't want to upload or you've got something going on or as a podcaster, the days that you don't want to do interviews, and you don't feel well. You know, you're, you're getting up and you're putting in the time, you're putting in the effort. It's just like any other job or any other thing you're trying to get good at or succeed at. It takes it takes time. It takes you to go into to, to do the repetitions and to do all the things required to succeed on the platform. So I completely agree with everything that you're saying there. As far as you and your channel and where you are now and where you want to be. What is next for you, like short-term and long-term? What is the David Allen Arnold brand going to be in 2025, 2026? Like, what are you looking to do? Um, I have some big long-term goals. Um, I have a series of books about my life and my adventures. Uh, that is going to be a probably a Netflix-style uh, documentary series. Uh, we have been working on that also for almost 10 years. So that's coming. Um and so when I look at YouTube, I'm not particularly upset if YouTube doesn't go well today. Uh, I'm not particularly over the moon if it goes really well, <laughs> because YouTube's going to have wild ups and downs. So if you're starting YouTube, you got to know that you're going to get 10 million views in a week. And then for the next 76 weeks, <laughs> you're going to get uh, whatever tiny fraction of that is that's right and that's how it's going to go so so for me um i'm going to keep powering through i'm going to keep delivering value whether it's you know if i get a brand deal i want to deliver great value to the brand if it's just you watching my youtube short while you're waiting for the dogs to go for their walk and come back um i want you to have a really high quality 15 seconds or whatever, whatever time I get for you to watch my video. And the other thing I'll say is, and I think this is really important for the YouTube community. I come from other platforms where connections and relationships are more valued than YouTube traditionally does. And I bring that with me to YouTube. So I spend a lot of my time in the comment section. And um, I think everyone is a fan of Mr. Beast. 
Uh, I think he's doing amazing things, but he made a comment on one of his podcast interviews that I don't know. I, I don't, I don't ever look at the comment section. And I think uh, that is not for me. I believe that when I watch, I'm a fan of the UFC. And when I watch my favorite UFC fighters, I appreciate the ones that on their way to the cage, they walk through that entire stadium and on their way to the cage, they stop and touch and high five and fist bump every single person that they can on the way into the cage and on the way out of the cage, win or loss. And that's how I look at YouTube is I don't look at it as, hey, YouTube, give me millions of views and give me fame. I look at it as how many hands can I shake every time I go through YouTube. And so for me, I really value the time that I spend uh, talking to people in the comments. And uh, I think YouTube has that thing where you can reply mm -hmm. to a comment with an, another post. And if you want to make someone's day, <laughs> Because first of all, people are usually surprised if I write back. They go, oh, well, okay, thank you for writing back to me. And then if I make a post of, you know, based on their question, because they're they're now in the next post, they get so ex they just they just burst. They get so excited mm -hmm. that A, someone took time to acknowledge them and answer their question or reply to their comment or their idea. And B, that a creator that they follow took the time to create something based on something that they said. It's one of the ways that you create those, what they call those rabid fans, those, those people who are going to be your lifelong fans by doing things like that. And it's why I love live streams so much because you actually have the personal interaction with those people and you can interact with your audience. Now, Replying to every comment isn't for everyone, but if you are a small, medium, growing-sized YouTube creator, if you're not doing that, what are you doing? I mean, you're missing out on one of the greatest ways of getting feedback of from the people commenting. They're taking time out of their day to pause the video, or while they're watching the video on their phone, going and typing and tapping. They're taking time out of their day to give you feedback, whether positive or negative. Now, there are the trolls out there. There are the people who are obviously in their mom's basement. Let's ignore those that, that 5 to 10%. The remainder, whether it's positive or constructive criticism, whatever it may be, this is how you can get better. And this is where you form the relationships of the people who are going to trust you and build your channel up over time as they come back over and over and over again, right? They're David Allen Arnold fans. They're people who are going to want to connect with him. Maybe they're not even interested in his most recent upload. They just like David. And so they're watching his stuff because they're that invested into him as a creator. And that, as, that, as, Yeah. That's the, you have, you have tapped into such an important thing that, that no one ever discusses. Um, I have more followers on Facebook than YouTube and Facebook is extremely community oriented. Mm -hmm. So if I post something on Facebook, this is a stadium full of 200,000 people who like me and know me, <laughs> I get a certain reaction from that. It's a, it's a safe environment. And if someone says you're dumb and I don't like this and you did this wrong in the video. By the time I find that comment, 12 people have already written back to this guy mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, defended me. YouTube is not that way. YouTube mm -hmm. is not so community oriented and YouTube very much is trying to send your videos to people who don't subscribe to you, who don't know you, who don't like you and trust you. Mm -hmm. this just some random thing popped up while they were scrolling and what they're going to say to you is not the same as your 200,000 friends mm -hmm. <laughs> okay what they're going to say to you is what someone on the street or subway car would say to you if you suddenly grabbed their attention mm -hmm. and they didn't like what you said <laughs> and you could because 
when people get nasty comments on YouTube, I think the average person wilts and gets extremely emotionally upset. And either they're going to delete the comment and block the person, or they're going to write something nasty back. And I think that's totally, like you said, it's not for everyone. But if you can manage that, because if, if you write a comment on my trash truck video and you say, this is stupid, that's not how trash work, trash trucks work. Okay, I get those comments. And I hit the like button. <laughs> I like the comment. And then I write something back. I'm either going to crack a joke or I'm going to say, well, that's true. You know, I'm a helicopter cameraman. I really don't know how trash trucks work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have a polite, entertaining, engaged conversation with that person. So if someone sees that comment and they will, <laughs> they're going to go, oh, that's interesting. So this, this was a typical YouTube hater, which are in every comment section. He didn't delete that guy. He didn't block him. He actually addressed it in a funny, polite way mm -hmm. and kept the conversation flowing. And because if you write something mean about my trash truck video, I will probably ask you a question. <laughs> um, or I will, if, if, if you've said, well, you, you don't understand how trash trucks work. This video is wrong. I go, oh, that's a great point. You know, I'm a helicopter cameraman. I don't really, you know, why don't you tell me how it works? Well, haters <laughs> love to impress people with their knowledge. So if this is a trash truck driver and he's just a mean dude and he, he thought he was going to put the hammer on me and delete me, you know, I, I would leave YouTube after his comment. And then I say, well, how does it actually work? Or uh, what do you know about trash trucks? And then that guy writes a paragraph. And usually th th this is what people don't know. Usually, more than half of the time, he completely warms up. One eighty, because, yep. because I didn't delete him, I didn't block him, I didn't tell him to pound sand, I didn't write profanity back to him. I asked him to give us his value, even mm -hmm. if it's the opposite of whatever I thought when yep. I made the video. A and so, usually, those guys will warm up, and then another trash truck driver comes in and says, well, you know, Dave's actually 20% right because yes, the trash trucks work like this, but this thing in the video, actually it can happen. And here's why. And this is why my truck has this lever <laughs> and, and, and what just happened? Well, this, this guy, this hater who really wanted to just hit me and make me go away all of a sudden he's now having a conversation in a real way with me and probably four or five other people and they're all going back and forth and then you've got people who know nothing about trash trucks and they're all watching it and they're they're learning from the conversation um and this is the hidden side of youtube that i think most creators get scared of and react emotionally to and cheat themselves out of by deleting comments and blocking people when they they haven't figured out if a guy said if a guy I don't know says something rude to me that says nothing about me that just speaks to him he's a mean guy if i handle it in a polite professional upbeat usually funny way people go Oh, oh, that's kind of cool. Like Dave's a guy that I would want to go with on a, you know, a boat cruise <laughs> because he doesn't hate people. He doesn't freak out when something goes wrong. He's actually a thoughtful person. And we could have like a lot of fun talking to Dave on this cruise, even if there's people on the boat that don't like him. 
Yeah, it's something that YouTube really lacks is the sense of community and that other social platforms. And YouTube has really tried. They've tried to crack that nut with a lot of different things, the community tab. They obviously have the comments section. But the feedback there sometimes is uh, unhelpful at best, right? Uh, but uh, I love the, the things that they're trying. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to put out a piece of content that is a conversation starter. It not only helps other people, but it also helps you as a creator because that means people are on your video longer, helps your retention and watch time. Uh, there's so many positive things that come from responding and communicating. Uh, David, we have gone a, a, a good bit long here, but I love it. You have been such an amazing guest and you have so much value to share for creators that I think the takeaway, the main takeaway for me here is just your perspective of if people had your perspective when, with their YouTube channels and their content online, we would have so fewer, we have much fewer people quitting YouTube because they would go in it looking at it from such a positive light of, I just want to help others. I just want to be a positive influence. I, I just want to create content that makes a difference. And you went into it at that. And yet you're getting the results that all these people want. You're getting the millions of views across platforms. You're getting the 200,000 subscriber YouTube channel. You're doing all the things that these people want. You're making money, doing all the things that they want. So I love that. David Allen Arnold has been my guest today. He is a wonderful creator. I'm going to put all of his social links in the show notes of this episode. David, thank you so much for joining us today. That's it. God bless you. Uh, I really believe in your mission. I love that you're always teaching people uh with every kind of topic every kind of youtuber uh that's why i love listening to your show and it's it's an absolute honor uh to be on your show and to be a part of your community thank you